Welcome to Quick Shots, a short format of traditional archery podcast, where we introduce you to some of the world's most influential traditional archers, and occasionally, some random dudes. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Quick Shots. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification. We upload a new episode every Wednesday, and they just keep getting better and better. If you or someone you know is an interesting trad archer, leave a comment below. We'd love to get you on the show. If you want to support the channel, head on over to the tradlifearchery.com. We have toques, we have hats, we have mugs, just a bunch of stuff over there. And anything you buy goes to support this channel. We do really appreciate it. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Quick Shots. I'm here with Kai Ferno, author, motivational speaker, survivalist, TV show host, award-winning stunt woman, but most importantly, a traditional archer. Hi, Kai. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you very much for doing this. This is so nice of you. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad I can get into your busy schedule. Every time I see you, you are posting some great stuff on Instagram, and you are all over the place, all over. How Always. About, <laughs> I know. So I gave a little bit of an introduction, but why don't you tell uh, you know our listeners or viewers um, to sort of your background story, uh, and then can you touch on your traditional archery origin story too? When did you start traditional archery, and, and just go through from there? Thanks. Sure. Um, I guess, obviously, I'm Australian, and I was just an outdoor chick, just hanging out in the outdoors, a bit active, but not overly active. And then I ended up breaking my back at 19 and being inside for a very long time, decided I was not going to be inside for the rest of my life. It sort of defined where I was headed, truly. And I I became an outdoor guide as I healed from the car accident. So rock climbing, kayaking, um, hiking, just anything to do with the outdoors, loved it. And then when I decided to stop that at about 26, I decided to become a stunt performer. So 16 years in Hollywood, doubling some of the biggest names, um, Jennifer Garner, Anne Hathaway, Sharon Stone, on some of the biggest movies, you know, like the Avengers, Pirates of the Caribbean, like I had an, an incredible career, was super fortunate. And then as I was looking to retire from stunts, I went back to my first love, which was the outdoors. Um, I hiked across the Sierra Nevadas with just a pocket knife and filmed the whole thing and Discovery found me from that. So I headed um, in to do the first season of Naked and Afraid. They um, they asked me, I said no. They asked me again, I said no. They asked me again and I said <laughs> yes. <laughs> Finally, and it was the biggest survival challenge that you could ever accept, naked with just one survival item and another person for 21 days. So I accepted it for the challenge and... Um, at that stage, I was a vegetarian and had been for 20 years due to health reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me a long time to recover from that first naked and afraid. And then I started to get a lot of health problems and someone suggested it could be healed by using the carnivore diet. And I decided that if I was going to eat meat, I was going to hunt my own meat. So as a child, I had, you know, used guns in the outdoors, but it never really felt right to me. So immediately as I decided I was going to hunt my own meat, I picked up a, a bear super grizzly and it felt absolutely right in my hands and I knew that that was going to be the weapon of my choice I love to keep things simple so when someone hands me a compound bow and it's got all the, um yeah it's got all those cogs and wheels and bits that can break and I'm just like oh there's just too many pieces in this puzzle that can go wrong and I loved the simplicity of just the bow the string and the arrow um, I wanted to be a very ethical hunter, like I know that a traditional bow takes a long time to master. So I spent an entire year, every single day, shooting arrows. It was a interesting journey for me being a female. Now, I know we sort of, you know, that male, female thing, but every time I would go to ask for help with the bow, people would be like, ah, oh, you're doing it all wrong and this and that. And I had to really find my own way um you know if I say to people I shoot a 600 spine with a 200 weight tip everyone's like that's not going to be right for you but by the time I go through my draw length and my weight and the poundage of the bow and we do all the math they're like yeah no that's right for you, <laughs> you, know, so you did, it, it was a long journey but after a year I felt like I could you know consistently from 
20 to 30 meters shoot the area of a target that I wanted yeah. and yeah. I headed out to hunt. That's, a, that's amazing. That's amazing. So you just picked it up and it, it all, it all stemmed from being ethical really. And, and mm. you said, Hey, you know, if I'm going to do this carnivore diet, um, I want to get my own meat and this is how I want to do it. You know, I have a very similar story, um, you know, coming from Canada and being and living in the U S and then hadn't hunt, hunted, you know, most of my life. But then when I picked something up, my, my wife actually said to me, it's like, look, if you're going to hunt, do it the right way, get, you know, go back to your roots where you were, you know, as a kid, I was growing up, I was shooting traditional bow and hunt that way. No guns, no sights, no nothing. Just do it that way. Then, you know, we're okay with it. Um, so, so yeah, it's very, very similar. And that's another thing we have in common. Uh, you didn't mention anything about your martial arts background training too. I think you took some training in Canada. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, to become a stunt performer, everyone was gymnasts and I was just like, well, I can't do any gymnastics at this age. And so I began fight training and did like basically three years of solid training and then trained on the job after that. That's, that's amazing. And that was out in BC, in British Columbia or. Yeah. Thank you. The... Yeah. That's awesome. So you're, you're an honorary Canadian really. So uh, that's nice. we got a little bit in common. It's funny to find people, especially Australians. They, they, they're, I've met quite a few Australians that have moved out to Canada and had some experience living in Canada. So that's kind of cool. We're kind of kindred spirits. You guys are just the warm Canada. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I really loved it there. I actually became a Canadian citizen for like 10 years. Um, but then that expires, you know, when you move to America and they're like, well, do you want American or Australian or Canadian? And you're like, uh, I guess I'll take American now. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And so you, you were talking a little bit about your movie career in, in doing that. Are you doing any stunt work currently or will you be doing any or is that, what are you doing now? Mm -hmm. I tore my hamstring completely off um, up at the butt. So that screwed back on again. And, um, you know, I mean, it was at the age of 40, am I now? It was about 43, 44 when I did it. And I had wanted to retire from stunts at 40. You know, like it's a really hard job on your whole body and women in particular we have really little necks so doing all that like smashing and crashing even just constantly selling punches and, and stuff like that your neck um just becomes really worn out and so a lot of women that were over 40 all had their vertebra fused in their neck mm -hmm. and I was just like oh like I don't want to live the rest of my life like that so in knowing that potentially you have half your life ahead of you. So I was trying to ease out of stunts, but I just loved it too much. So I was kind of glad when the hamstring fell off, but um, there's always part of me that felt like stunts was taken away from me rather than me stepping away from stunts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know that I'll do at least one more one day somehow. I just know it. But you're doing so much more right now. Um, you know, you're helping out. Uh, well, you have a show. Do, do, you, do you have a show on now or, or is there something that you're doing with uh, uh, women in the outback or young girls or something I read? Um, I, I do camp. Yep. Yeah, so I do camp courage for young women. So that's just about uh, mainly finding your mental courage. You know, we don't do a lot of physical stuff, but it's looking how do you deal with fear and how do you how do you achieve your goals and how do you find your brave? So I do a bit of that stuff. I do have a TV show called Outback Lockdown, which is um, it aired in the US maybe six months ago, but it's currently airing around in 20 countries around Asia. Um, and I'm also just working and developing a kids show um, that's more safety than survival, but just um in development with abc on that one. Oh, that's awesome I, you know i love that how to develop your brave so mm -hmm. i think you know that's something that obviously you you know a lot about um and uh just coming from where you were like if i had a broken back i think i would be like yeah i, I guess i will be done for the rest of my life you know so <laughs> you be brave enough to get back into it and then say you know what i'm not just going to be brave i'm going to be extra brave i'm gonna be quite honest with you that's like doubly brave uh to go back and do all the stuff that you did that's amazing Am amazing i know bear grills you know and you know bear grills right bear mm -hmm. grills he yeah. has a similar story he broke his back in a in a skydiving uh when he was with the uh the british um sas 
And then he got back into it and he started doing some of the stuff that you, that you do, you know, this survivalist training and, and stuff. That's amazing. So I just don't know how you guys do it. Yeah. Is it just, I that- think you just, you just look inside and for me, it's about pushing my limits, you know, like this doctor said to me, you'll never be physically active for the rest of your life. And he put this limit on me and I thought like, meh, don't like that. Like, let's just keep pushing it and seeing where these limits actually are. Like that's where he put his limits. Yeah. And I've just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. Like people keep asking me, why do you keep doing these really extreme challenges? You know, so I did um, a season of Naked and Afraid where they put you out alone. So 21 days by yourself. And they put me in one of the most extreme locations, the Amazon, and it was at the end of wet season. So it was just miserable. But it's, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I didn't get to my limits, you know. So I just keep going like, well, if that wasn't them, like, man, there must be something just beyond that. So for me personally, it's like when I think I can't take another step, I just take another step and I'm like, wow, would you look at that? You know, <laughs> and you're just like, I'm going to take another step and just see, you know, I mean, I... I've just taken up running, which I just, you know, I usually say, if you see me running, you better start running because there's probably something chasing me. But I've just started running for like a project I have coming up and like I feel tired and I feel like I want to stop. And then I check in and I'm like, am I puffing? Like, am I, I'm like, no, I can still breathe properly. I'm like, does my body feel okay? And I'm like, sure, you know, like it's not, it's not agonizing. And and so I just keep running, you know, like at the time I probably would have normally stopped. I just take another step and another step and another. So that's sort of, yeah, that's where being put this limit on me made me go. It made me go like, well, what is my limit? And I think we stop too, you know, like far beyond what we're capable of. Like people say, well, you could do it. And I I'm like, I am no one special. Like I never won awards at school. I never, I never got athletic awards. I never was the, I was always picked last for the sporting team. So all I'm doing that's different is taking that extra step. I think you have two things that are really important and you can, they come out just even in this interview, one, you're extremely brave and two, you have a great mental fortitude. Uh, And that, those two things, you can't really coach or teach, you know, it's almost like you, you, you have to have the inner determination and will. And when you were just explaining there running, I did a lot of running in the army. Um, I couldn't stand it. Yeah. And you know, you push your, you push your body because you know, the guy next to you depends on you to be there. Right. But if Mm. that guy wasn't there, I don't know that I would have kept going, but for you, it's that guy doesn't need to be there. You have, Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. I, and, and I want to kind of bring that around to back and we're going to talk back about archery because this is an archery mm-hmm. at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you did say that you did, you learned how to shoot a pie plate, you know, or six inch plate or whatever from, you know, uh, 20 and 30 uh, meters, which is, you know, that's a great distance. That's a pretty big distance for traditional archery. So that's a tough game. That's a tough mental game to do that consistently. And um, people know that. So they call, you know, it, we call it struggle stick because some days you can do it. Some days you can't. Right. And I just think that people with your type of attitude and, and mentality uh, that are mentally strong just are better at this. Did you find it hard or did you, was it something easy to do to get into traditional archery and be that accurate? I think the thing that's transferable for me is being okay to be bad. You know, like um, I always start from scratch, you know, like if I'm starting on a new movie set and they're like, well, we've got Jennifer Garner here and she's using this new weapon that's called a sigh that you probably haven't used before. Like I don't beat myself up. I know there's a beginning, you know. So I think that what happens with people with art, traditional archery is they think like, so there's this accelerated learning at the beginning so I've seen beginners and they'll just pick up the bow and never having done it and go Fidunko, is that how you do it and it's right in the center of the target yeah. and you're like that's fantastic and they'll do that for an hour and then the next day they won't be able to hit the target for miles so then they beat up on themselves and be like well maybe I'm not very good at this and get in their own heads and I feel like a lot of traditional archery is about your head it's about your mindset and it's about not letting that arrow that you just shot define the next arrow that you're about to shoot. Mm -hmm. And that for me is stunts, you know, like if I'm on set and I've got one take, 
I can't be dwelling on the fact that I got it wrong in rehearsal. I just have to be dwelling on what I need to do to make it perfect now. So it's about this instantly letting go of the last shot to move on to the next shot without getting into your head about why that last shot went bad. I don't know. That's what works for me. Yeah. And, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to go back just a little bit more and say, and, you know, I mentioned as in the intro that you're a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. Most people are scared to death to do that. Like, I mean, you know, it's that old joke where the, you know, 90% of the people are afraid to speak and only 10% of people are afraid to die. And so what that means is that you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, you know, it's like, me too, to be honest, like motivational speaking scares me to death and I do it. And every time I get up, I, I'm nervous. Like I just spoke the other day at a music festival for mental health and I, it was such a big deal for me that the 20 minutes, my voice just shook the whole time. Ooh. And I'm just like, I've been doing this for 10 years. And, and then I was doing a TV interview and they said, what scares you? And I said, public speaking and they all laughed and they're like but you're so good on the interviews and I was like oh my god like I have a tattoo that says I'm not afraid I was born to do this and people think it's stunts and it's public speaking you know like every time I get up I have to remind myself that everything in my life has led to this one moment so <laughs> trust me I do it but it terrifies me every time that's so good. I mean, so I, I equate that to competing in archery, you know, like when you get up on the line, you're competing in archery and there's so many people there and you want to think to yourself, you know, the, the, the way to do that is they're not there to watch you is what, you know, which is totally different than what you're doing. Motivational speakers, they're there to watch you. So the, the focus is right on you. But even then, when you know, people don't care about you, they just go shoot your stuff on the line. You, be, you still feel stressed because you think, oh, everyone's watching me. But when you're motivational yeah. speaking, it's really tough. And by the way, you are good in interviews. You're very smooth, obviously. And we're moving through this really, really quick. <laughs> I, I just, I, I find it hard to believe that you you get um, a tad nervous uh, when you go up and do public speaking. That, that's, that's, what was the event you were talking about? What did you just do? Um, it was a music festival held in a small country town in the mid north of like in, in essentially the outback. And, um, you know, there's a lot we have a lot of issues with um, farmers and mental health. You know, it's a very isolated um, way of living. And so this uh, guy there um, just set up this music festival to try and raise some money and awareness because a lot of his mates were committing suicide and it's grown over the years and they have incredible bands that come from all over the state to play there and uh one of the things he likes to do is because it's been men's mental health he's had male motivational speakers come up and chat about mental health mm -hmm. and i just he just happens to be an amazing fabricator who did um the the canopy on the back of my truck so he like when when he found out what I did he asked me if I would come along and speak on behalf of the women in who may have been in the audience and um when people ask I try and if I can do it I'll I'll do it you know like I don't have a lot of spare time as you see but one of my ways of giving back is if people ask me for something that's important to them. If I can make it happen, I will. So I just went and spoke with them. But, um, you know, it was my, I grew up in that outback area. So that was my hometown from being a very young child. And, you know, you've got all these amazing bands playing and then I'm going to get up and be like, hey, so let me tell you a little bit about me. <laughs> so it was, it was slightly intimidating, but they were a wonderful audience. And uh, a couple of the thank yous afterwards even like moved me to tears. So it was, it was worthwhile for sure. You're an Australian treasure though. <laughs> My mum likes to think so. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good and, and you're you're uh you're very popular on instagram and, and places i mean I, I think you're very motivational just in what you do and all the things that all these other things i mean there's so many things that you do so you're definitely an inspiration to uh all the women on the internet seems like but you know men i mean i can i'm very inspired by the things you say and do too i mean it's pretty interesting uh i didn't know a lot about you i'll be honest until you know i talked to we got a, a mutual friend who put us in touch with each other uh, and then I, of course, stalked you like crazy. Um, <laughs> I know everything about you now. I know what you had for lunch this morning. So that's, 
<laughs> considering I've only had breakfast. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I- I, I, I'm, I know what you will have. Uh, right. <laughs> so let's, speaking of food, speaking of food, you are also a hunter. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that's, and that's, that's pretty, the way you hunt is kind of interesting to me because it's in Australia and it's foreign to us because it's mm-hmm. foreign, right? So can you kind of walk me through your hunting experience, how you got involved in hunting, and then what you, what you regularly hunt? Well, the interesting thing for me is, like I mentioned before, just being female comes with its its own set of, I wouldn't say challenges, but just things that come along with it. So I was finding as I was posting my archery stuff, as I was developing it, people would be like, isn't it nice that you've got that man that's doing that with you and stuff like that? And I was just like, right. I like, I... I know how to cut up an animal. I know how to process the leather. I know how to use the whole animal. Like I know how to do these things, but people seem to think that if there's a guy in the picture, not that I'm teaching them something, but that I must be learning from them. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit stubborn and um, a friend of both Andy and myself, Jack Spinks, he he was amazingly supportive of me as I was, going on my journey like he was the first one to be like you know what you've got a 35 pound bow but don't just hunt rabbits like you'll be able to hunt small deer and you'll be able to hunt um goats and so I sort of you know he really encouraged me to up my game so I hadn't actually shot anything before and I decided I was going to go for three weeks solo off-grid hunting and I was going to just live off whatever I could get so my cousin has a massive 38,000 acre property in the mid north of South Australia and I knew there was like an old stone ruin on there so I was going to go and live at that ruin away from him like it's about 5k's from his property and not see another soul and if I didn't hunt successfully I wasn't going to eat And on my way, I went past Jack's house on my way driving there and Jack helped me get my first goat. And so I'd shot one goat and then I went and put my life on the line to prove that I had gotten good enough to hunt for myself. So I spent three weeks there. I shot five goats. I made five bits of leather from their pelt. I used the intestines to make cord. I boiled the skulls. I like used the whole animal I could and just ate goat for for three weeks. Um, So that's what we mainly hunt in Australia. We are allowed to hunt our feral animals. We're not allowed to hunt any of our native animals. They're all protected. So, um, but we don't have times of year. So you guys have licenses Season, yeah. and tags and, yeah. and hunting seasons. So we can go out any time of year and hunt feral animals as long as we have a hunting license appropriate to the state. Yeah. And a lot of the animals are feral. Yeah. So we have an alarming number of goats, deers, deers, deer, pigs, rabbits, foxes, and um, all of that is fair game. Um, we have the, um, like up north, you get the uh, buffalo and stuff, you know, like we get, we have camels that are feral. You know, you can go and shoot a camel if you want. Um, so anything that is destroying our native floral or the fauna's habitat, you is is go for it. That's so funny, man. You go, yeah, I don't know who's listening to this, but if you want to go on a camel hunt with me, by all means, contact me. Let's get down to Australia. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to shoot a camel because, you know, I think of Lawrence Arabia. Uh, but I can't, I couldn't I can put the two together, but definitely. Apparently they're delicious. Darn it. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, don't, I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know. I do <laughs> like the fact that you have like six different species of deer down there that you can hunt. And it's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, you're doing more than way, like, I, that's way beyond my expertise. I could never do cordage or anything like that from animals and, uh, you know, using all their parts and that. And I, I wouldn't know what the first thing to do with a hide other than give it to a taxidermist. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Um, so, so you're, you're hunting goats is, and I think when we tried to get together the first time you were out doing a goat hunt too, do you always use mm-hmm. a bow? Yes. Wow. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't used 
No, I mean, it, as you know, our Australian gun licenses and laws are um, really strict. It's incredibly hard to get a gun license, um, but anyone can pick up a bow and hunt. I mean, there are some restrictions, like I can't with a 35 pound bow hunt Samba, um, but I can shoot the smaller deer species, um, which I think, I think should be up for debate because I think, you know, Fred Bear proved that you could kill a lot of big animals with a low poundage bow. It's just about where, you know, okay. how accurate, you know, you know, like a double lung shot on a buffalo is the same as a double lung shot. On, you know, if you can get it in that right spot, it's going to be, and from an appropriate distance, it's going to pierce where you need it to bring it down. But so when yeah. you hunt, when you hunt goats, do you, you don't, you're not doing it from tree stands or you're you doing it from ground blinds or how are like sneaking up on them or how, why yeah, do see, we, don't, we don't usually do tree stands here, you know? So like when I went to America and I just before COVID hit, I was over there and I had a deer hunt organized and um, the guy I was going to go with, he's like, you know, how, how's your tree stand shooting? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, it's a completely different angle from up there. And then I had to like climb a tree and practice shooting that angle because we just never do it here. So one of the things about goats is learning their habits. They drink a hell of a lot of water um, and they have to come to water on sunny days, like on really hot days, they have to come to water every day. And other than that, it's uh, probably every three days. So if you can find a good water source and wait they're going to drink morning on hot days like early mornings and late in the evening so um you know it's about learning their habits and then they'll go on bed down so if you know where the nearest good bedding down area is you know if it's a colder windy day you know they're going to be on the move but you know they're going to eat into the wind so it's like much like any game it's about learning their habits and patterns um so you know, I mean, and it's the same with our deer here, but we usually stalk, uh, sport, stalk and spot, you know, there's not, awesome. not a lot of sitting and waiting. We have a vast amount of land. The deer could be anywhere. It's a matter of really finding them rather than them coming to you. So, so unlike North America, you actually have to be in physical shape to good physical shape to hunt. <laughs> yeah. Like most of the hunting boys I know are, are pretty, um, pretty fit. So that's awesome. Hey, um, so, so I want to come back to, to, um, you know, any little piece of advice that you would have for someone new into archery, what, what would you, what would you say is like, Hey, here's the secret sauce. Here's something that you could do to get better or, or even something motivational to say, Hey, get into archery. It's kind of cool or, or not. I, you know, I, what, what do you got? Is there anything interesting that you want to share? I mean, I feel like, um, that primitive part of our brain that used to hunt millennia ago resonates with a traditional bow more than anything, but just with hunting in general. Um, so I really recommend trying it to begin with because a lot of it, people think um, it, like I, I step over ants. So like, I'm not a killer. Yeah, but there was a feeling of extreme rightness about being able to provide my own food in a very traditional way. I would encourage you to listen to everybody, but and try it, but take only what fits for you. You know, like I, I never wander through this world going, I know, I know, I know, like this is what's best for me because people have been able to say, well, actually, you know, if you just change this string, you're going to shoot way better. And, and I thought I had the right string and I didn't, you know. So listen to everybody, try what works and hold on to 100% what works. Um, be yeah, because you never know what's going to make you better. But also once you've found your system, stick with it. You know, it's very important that everything is consistent with your shots. Like I know a lot of people who continually change their systems and I feel like they're continually racing to catch up. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is just hunt. You know, like the American Indians weren't going like, oh, my God, I need to get 20 shots in the size of this before I can go out and do it. You know, like some of the best target hunters are the worst animal hunters. And I find like, even if I'm shooting a little bit out on a bloody foam dice, mm -hmm. my arrow 
when I've got an animal in it in my sight just knows where to go like I'm a far better hunter than I am a target shooter so just go out and give it a go yeah no I I, I agree I agree I think that you know once you you get the fundamentals down don't change that your process trust your process Mm -hmm. all these outside influences I think you mentioned it earlier in the show that so many guys will come on and give you advice that, you know, it's really not wanted. And I talked about this a little bit in my last uh, podcast that, you know, there, everyone has advice. Everyone has advice. You just got to find the right one. You got to find people you trust and then listen to that advice and keep the process. It's really good advice. I think mm-hmm. more people should take it. Unfortunately, sometimes, and I, I hate to say this, but women seem to get the most advice, you know, they, 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 they're given the most advice and it's kind of rough because they, you know, you might not know as a beginner, which, which is good and which is not. And then it becomes overwhelming. Right. Unfortunately. Um, yes. So, and I like, I've been into archery shops with a couple of my male friends that are hunters and I'm always like, watch this, watch this, you know, and without fail, like the people in the store will be like, you want this pink compound bow. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, actually, do you have any of the like, you know, traditional 600 grain gold, gold tips, please, you know, like, yeah. and they're like, what size? I'm a 32 inch. They're like, hmm, do you need it cut? And like, just, you know, like, and, yeah. and when I start talking, I, I know more than the people behind the counter, but it's like, my male friends have doubted me when I've said, like, I get treated differently and they'll just come in the archery shop with me and they'll walk out and they'll just be like, oh my God, oh my like, God. it's true. So I just encourage people out there to not assume because of gender, a, a knowledge bank or a different, you know, set of skills. And, um, and wait for someone to ask for your advice, you know, like if they're, if you see someone making the same mistake over and over, I'm never one to be like, Hey, if you just try this, I'm just, you know, if someone says, is there something I'm doing wrong? I'll be like, well, I don't know if it's wrong, but this is how I do it. Like maybe try that. Just, you know, it, it is um, a level of respect that we all deserve to have when we're uh, participating in such a, a highly skilled craft. Yeah. And, and again, so if you get too much advice or you're giving someone too much advice, unwanted advice, you're actually encouraging that p- person to stop learning. Mm. And that's not yeah. what we want. Mm. we want. We want people to continue to go. I want to give a little plug for, for quick shots here. We have some fantastic female archers on quick shots go through. If you're listening now and, and Kai's the first one, you're, you're maybe new here, go back and take a li- listen to some of those other female archers amazing people if you're a female archer and, and that's kind of how you want to learn from a, another female archer because there are nuances uh to men and women obviously so you know go back and you can you can talk to any of those people contact them at any time and with that kai how can people contact you if they want to get in touch with you uh over the internet um it's definitely socials so i have at Kai Freno, so it's an easy first name, just K Y and then F U R N E A U X um, on Insta and Facebook. And then I have a website which is www.kaifreno.com. So um, there's a contact form on that. And yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm always available to help anyone out that asks because, you know, I believe that we can all make each other better in the end. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And thanks for being here. Thanks for everyone listening. Uh, we really appreciate it. Until we talk again, stay safe. We'll talk to you soon.